welcome to my Tesla or more accurately what's remaining of my Tesla it's a 2019 Model 3 Performance it's actually sort of my sixth electric vehicle it's not as comfortable as it used to be Back in 2019, I had started the process of converting a 2002 BMW E46 wagon, uh, but I was actually still using it in its petrol form while I got all the parts together and did all the research. But in the meantime, I'd got a white BMW E46 sedan that I ended up using just as a bit of a prototype vehicle for the electric system so I could keep the wagon on the road at the time. So I guess that white BMW E46 was technically my first electric vehicle. Change the fuse to 30 amp. Vacuum pump must be leaking somewhere. Power steering pump's working fine now. Okay, test. Contactors. Uh, temperatures. Brakes. Then there was the two hail damaged Nissan Leafs, one which I'd register and we'd use as our main car, the other one I parted out uh, planning to use the parts for that for the Land Rover conversion, so I guess they were two and three. Then after that we got the MG ZS EV, because we, we needed the longer range, so I guess that was number four. We didn't really need the Leaf anymore, so that became my mum's first electric vehicle, which worked out really well. Uh, then in 2021, I actually finished the conversion on my BMW wagon. Let's trip in the BMW wagon. Hang it on. I didn't end up getting it registered though. Well, so technically you have to get it engineered to do that. And it had actually been damaged in the same hailstorm as the Nissan Leafs that got damaged. Didn't seem economical to spend literally thousands of dollars on engineering a car, which was hail damaged and was never really going to be worth much. Um, but that was okay because that car became and is still our massive power wall for our house. Uh, it's got 42 kilowatt hours of uh, recycled laptop batteries. So that's equivalent to three Tesla power walls. So it's brilliant as a home power wall. So it's just sort of sitting there uh, soaking up solar during the day and powering a house at night. So it's actually worked out well and it actually didn't cost me a lot. It was a, a real budget build that one. Um, and I got a lot out of it just from the fun of doing it and learned heaps. So it actually did work out in the end, even though we don't use it as an electric car. So, but technically I guess that's, that was my fifth because I have driven it. I then decided that, um, the parts that I'd got out of the second Nissan Leaf for the Land Rover conversion weren't really a good fit for the Land Rover. So. Um, I started looking around for Tesla Model 3s. So a good way to find uh, salvaged vehicles and salvaged EVs is um, there's two main places, Mannheims and Pickles, they do salvaged auctions. So I was keeping my eyes open on those and quite a few came up but none at the price I wanted it or the specs I wanted. Uh, so I ended up getting this one off eBay of all places ended up paying $20,099 for this one, uh, which I thought was a pretty good deal, um, considering this is the top of the line dual motor premium, premium version with the larger 75 kilowatt hour battery. So there's a question, I guess, why uh, buy a written off EV as parts for a conversion? I mean, the easiest way to do any conversion is just to pay a company to do it for you. Uh, I quickly wrote that off though, one, because 
you know, it's something I really enjoy doing and I didn't want to miss out on that fun. And two, the cost is for the Land Rover, the specs I wanted would be 120,000 plus. I don't have that sort of money. Another way you can do it, which is quite a common way to do it, is just to buy all the parts new from a um, parts supplier. Fairly easy to source. Um, but the problem with that is it still ends up being quite expensive. And those parts you buy are typically not nearly as good as the OEM parts from a um, mass-produced EV. Also, another way to do it is just to buy those secondhand OEM parts from, you know, eBay and um, secondhand places like that. Um, but it probably doesn't end up saving you a lot in the long run once you add up the cost of all those individual parts, um, especially if you can buy one EV that you can utilise most of the parts from. So why did I choose a Model 3 out of all the different EVs that are available. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, so as I said, I had the uh, parts out of the Nissan Leaf. Um, uh, they have an 80 kilowatt electric motor. That would have actually been a significant performance boost over the original Land Rover motor if, it, if I coupled it straight to the front of the gearbox. The main issue with the Leaf is the battery just wasn't suitable for the Land Rover at all. I need a decent sized battery in the Land Rover to get the range I want. And capacity wise, it'd be at least three Nissan Leaf batteries. And those early Nissan Leaf batteries aren't very good. The chemistry isn't great. And because Nissan are sort of the only modern EV that don't thermally manage their battery, um, they degrade quite quickly. And so that Nissan Leaf battery I had had degraded down to about 70% of the capacity it was. And the battery is the single most important part of any EV as far as performance uh, and range go. So it's important to get a good, good battery. It is the most important thing in an EV conversion and the most expensive thing. So the Model 3, battery wise, uh, the this one had the larger battery the standard versions have a 50 52 kilowatt hour battery i think it was and the long range versions and the performance versions had the bigger 75 kilowatt hour battery so that's pretty much a great size for the land rover you could go a bit bigger um, but then you're adding weight and it's you know and cost and the batteries in these are really good they're very energy dense as in they have a lot of capacity for both the size and the weight they are. They have really good cooling. They have integrated cooling through the battery modules. That single biggest element of a EV conversion, that's one of the main reasons for getting a Tesla Model 3. The Model 3 batteries are harder to use in a conversion in that they're really long, um, about 1.9 metre long modules. They've only, they've only got four modules sort of thin, 10 centimetres by 30 centimetres, but 1.9 metres long. So that's really hard usually to fit into a, an EV conversion, but it's actually an ideal size to fit in the cargo bay of my Land Rover. So that actually works out pretty well as far as mounting it. Um, the other reason I chose Model 3 is they are by far <laughs> the most populous EV not just in Australia, in the world, there's going to be more of more salvage Tesla Model 3s than any other car in the near future. It seems like a good opportunity to reuse those parts. And it's much more environmentally friendly reusing something like this than just buying new parts off the shelf. Also, all the other components in the Tesla Model 3, the motors are very good. These have two motors. I'm actually only going to be using one of them, the rear motor. They're very well thermally managed. They're really well designed. I think they're a mixture of permanent magnet and induction motor. Uh, they're very efficient, very small, heaps more power than the Land Rover will need. So the Model 3's drive unit, the rear one that I'm going to use, it's an integration of the motor which goes out to a single reduction gear, which goes to a 
differential and it also combines the uh, motor inverter, the control for the motor, uh, in a very small compact package, um, which is going to be really suited to how I'm going to uh, incorporate that into the Land Rover. Um, so rather than do the traditional method of just getting an electric motor and um, grafting it to the front of the original gearbox, um, the Tesla drive unit, the whole Tesla drivetrain, is going to replace the whole engine, gearbox, transfer case, centre diff, the whole thing. The Tesla drive unit will be spun through 90 degrees and instead of driving the left hand and right hand wheels of the Tesla, it's going to drive the rear and the front prop shafts of the Land Rover and it'll sit tucked down in the middle of the vehicle, sort of where the old transfer case in the Land Rover used to be. The other benefit of that is too, it, the whole engine bay is going to be pretty much empty, uh, apart from a few electrical components, air conditioner and battery and a few other little things. So yeah, have heaps more storage room up, up in the engine bay. There are a few modifications I'm going to have to do to the Model 3 drive unit. Um, namely, I'm going to have to change the gear ratio for the reduction gear because it's additionally going through the differentials of the Land Rover, uh, which are, uh, what is it, 3, 4 to 1 ratio from memory. The, the motor for the Tesla, even though it can rev to 16,000 RPM, the ratio is not going to be right. In other words, at 16,000 RPM, I think the Land Rover will only, only be going about 80 kilometres an hour. It would be an absolute torque beast, nothing would stop it, but I do want to drive quicker than 80 k's an hour. So I have to change the reduction gear ratios and also to uh, retain four-wheel drive capability in the Land Rover, that's the centre differential, which um, I'm going to be using the Tesla differential for now, needs to be upgraded to a limited slip differential. Luckily, uh, Zero EV in the UK have developed those systems pretty much specifically for the Land Rover. That actually works out really well. I'm actually gonna go a step fur further with the utilization of this Tesla um, and all the components. So the easiest way is just to, you know, use the battery and the motor, the big components. But to do that, you need to get an aftermarket controller. You can't use the original car's controller. If the car, the car computer, it needs to see the whole car as a whole, otherwise it'll get upset and throw warnings. So I'm looking at pretty much integrating the whole Tesla system, uh, motor, battery, computers, air conditioning, entertainment system, audio system, all the electrical components pretty much. It's sort of or a bit all or nothing. If you want to use the Tesla's original computer systems, they're expecting to see all the systems. <laughs> so it's a lot harder doing it that way, but you are able to utilize all the components, the air conditioner, the battery management system, the thermal system, all that sort of thing, which are really good in a Tesla and are worth using the Tesla system. The problem is if there is anything that I don't want to use, or is it, if there's anything more accurately that I can't use from the Tesla, um, and I just unplug that, for instance, I can't use the front motor, the way the motor's being integrated, um, I'm not going to be able to use the, the front motor. It's too hard to integrate into the Land Rover system. So unplugging that, obviously the Tesla's computer system is going to go, uh, there's a motor missing, I'm not going to turn on. Same with the power steering for the Tesla. It has a rack and pinion, more modern rack and pinion, whereas the Land Rover has a steering box. So I can't integrate that into the Land Rover. Um, same thing if the computer sees there's no steering on the car, it's going to freak out and go, hang on, what's, what's going on? I don't think I'm going to let you drive. Uh, the ABS system, the Land Rover doesn't have any wheel speed sensors, so I can't integrate the anti-lock braking system, traction control system from the Tesla. So there's things there that I actually can't really use from the Tesla. So, oh, good. Um, so the computer is going to get upset at that. So to get around that, it's basically a case of emulating those systems. In other words, sending signals to the main Tesla's computer, pretending to be those components, to pretending to be the front motor, um, sending signals to say, yeah, front motor's still in, everything's okay. 
nothing to see here. Um, so that they're the challenges. That's going to take a bit of time, but it's it's quite fun doing that sort of thing. Um, hacking into the computer systems, especially using a Tesla, it's worth trying to um, incorporate all those components because Tesla has a lot of cool features that I really do want to use in the Land Rover, um, like the the touch screen system, uh, in-car entertainment system, uh, navigation system, the heated seats, the yeah the air conditioner system, and Tesla have a really good thermal thermal management system which utilizes air conditioning to cool batteries and motor to heat batteries and have very good integration of those components. It's very well thought out and the software written for the Tesla is really good. Um, it's got a 14 speaker premium audio system in this because it's the, the uh, performance model and it sounds friggin awesome. Bluetooth, it's got lifetime uh, internet connectivity, climate control systems. I should be able to keep the adaptive cruise. It won't have, this car actually um, has had the full self-driving upgrade, but I'm not gonna be able to use that because I'm not using any of the steering systems. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, all the camera systems, I have dog mode, I'll have camp mode. Yeah, if I can get all those to work, that's pretty cool. That's gonna be pretty cool in the Land Rover. It's a challenge, but um, yeah, I'm up for it. <laughs> Let's give it a go. Dangerous. Well, I'm going to do that. So I don't get caught. And... Can you turn the music up a bit? Oh. So in the next video, we'll go back in time to before I pulled all the parts out of this when it was actually a driving car and do all the computer hacking and getting into the CAN bus systems and working out how everything works. So yeah, that'll be lots of fun. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in that one. Oops, falling off this piece of wood.